So welcome to OpenJS World, and today Jesse and I are going to be talking to you about Internet of Things with Node.js, both practical and fun. Before we get started, a little bit about ourselves. I'm Michael Dawson, the Node.js lead for IBM and Red Hat. Uh, what that means is I get to be uh, an active community member. I'm a collaborator, member of the Technical Steering Committee, and generally active uh, across the project. Um, it also gets to mean that, mean that means that I get to work with great teams across Red Hat and IBM, um, for example, Jesse, in terms of our support for Node.js on different platforms, as well as you know all, all sorts of things in terms of making Node.js first-class citizens in our offerings. And thank you, Michael. I'm Jesse. I am uh, work with IBM, as Michael mentioned. I'm the business architect of open source on a platform known as IBM I, uh, which you may have not heard about before, but it's definitely a, a platform with a strong impact like strong footprint in IT. It powers banks, insurance companies, all kinds of Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies as well. Uh, but in my role here at IBM, I get to set the strategy around open source technologies for that IBM I platform uh, around things like uh, open source languages and IoT. So just before we get started, a little bit of an idea of what we're going to go through. So we're going to start with a brief introduction to IoT and MQTT. So what are they? Why are they important? Uh, we'll look at using MQTT with uh, Node.js because they're a great fit. We'll take a look at some real physical devices. We'll talk about the anatomy of a simple MQTT light and temperature sensor, sensor that might fit one of your business use cases. We'll then show you MQTT and devices in action uh, in a demo part. We'll then touch on leveraging uh, MQTT with the cloud. And we'll finally, we'll finish up with a few thoughts on reactive applications and, and Kafka. So to start with, what is the Internet of Things? Uh, generally, it's what's used to refer to a network of physically connected devices. These devices provide data, often uh, you know, a constant stream of, of things like temperature, pressure, and so forth. Uh, they can also often be controlled, though. You can send a message back to the device, and you can turn a light on or off, uh, open a door, those kinds of things. And if you want a more con con comprehensive description, you can go and check out the, the wi wi Wikipedia listing for the Internet of Things. Now, one of the most commonly used protocols with uh, IoT devices is MQTT. It's uh, MQ, it stands for MQ Telemetry Transport. It was actually invited and invented by uh, somebody at, at IBM quite a while ago. And it's really popular because it's really lightweight. You can do a publish and subscribe. Um, so it's, it's a message based where you, you publish to topics and you can subscribe, subscribe to talk, topics, but it's very small. Um, it's got a small footprint, it requires low bandwidth, so you can get it into small devices, and it's fairly easy to use, and that's, you know, kind of why it's so popular. Again, you know, if you want to go back to uh, a reference, you can look at mqtt.org in terms of the, the formal definition there. The great thing is it's asynchronous, which is a really good fit for Node.js, as we know. So let's dive into some of the specific terminology. So the first thing you need to know is um, the client and the broker. So clients are basically, you know, devices, applications running on, say, an IBM I or some other platform, um, who connects to uh, a topic either to publish or subscribe messages. Uh, there's some great clients out there, so FAO and MQTTJS. So FAO is one which provides clients across a number of different platforms um, and languages. MQTTJS is a uh, NPM module um, written by one of the, the members of the uh, Node ecosystem. And you know it's a great choice when we're using Node. The broker is the piece that actually provides um, the, the 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 message queues and the persistence and sort of the back end. Often MQTT is provided as a protocol along with a bunch of other uh, protocols. So later on, Jesse's going to show us uh, AMQ, and AMQ supports uh, a number of different uh, protocols. MQTT being one of them. Uh, Mosquito is a uh, uh, you know a JavaScript pure JavaScript uh, broker that you can also use for experiment as, it, experimentation as well. So that's the client and the broker. Topics are basically you know an ID that we subscribe to when we want to listen for messages or what we publish on when we want to send messages. Messages themselves are free form, so they can basically be any any text. Um, so it's up to you to figure out what that formatting is going to look like. And then QoS stands for quality of service, and MQTT provides three different qualities of service, 0, 1, and 2, which we'll talk about in, in the subsequent slides. So 
let's look at topics. Topics are, uh, you know, one or more levels separated by a topic separator. And in, in this example, you know, we have factory is one level, floor is another level, and machine is another level. And I can, you know, ask when I subscribe, I can I can subscribe to a very specific level, to, you know, so I can subscribe to factory floor machine one, in which case I'll just get uh, messages for that one topic, or I can subscribe using wildcards, which I show a little bit below, so that I could get like all messages for topics that are underneath factory floor one, for example. There are a few restrictions. Um, they must be at least one character each each level, and they are case sensitive, so it's good to be aware of. Wildcards, which are very useful when you're subscribing on topics, are the plus, which matches a single level. Um, so in, in this case, you know, factory plus slash plus slash machine one will match factory floor one machine one, but not, you know, something where there's two intermediate levels like the second example. The hash sign, number sign, matches multiple levels, um, but it's only allowed at the end. So it basically says... I want to get uh, messages for all topics below this root that I'm specifying. And th those end up being quite quite useful. Um, at very least, if you're trying to figure out what topics are available and messages are, are, are coming into you on. Quality of service. Uh, there's three levels. They're very simple. You know, zero is at most once, one is at least once, and two is exactly once. And if you think about simple devices, at least, often, you know, at most once is, is all you need. If I'm sending, a, you know, a stream of temperature readings, it really doesn't matter if I, meet, if I miss, um, you know, uh, a message. Um, because the next one will come along and, you know, I'll still have the data. But depending on your application, you can use um, some of the other ones, which is like at least once you're guaranteed to have it delivered, although it may be repeated in that case. And then two is like, it's only, you're only ever going to get it. Of course, as you pick the higher levels, there's going to be more overhead. And so, you know, unless you really need to, you know, zero is probably the way to go. The other thing is, is that um, the QS is determined by the receiver. So even if you actually ask for a higher um, quality of service when you're sending, you may not get that on, on the other end. So now over to, to Jesse to sort of give us a little bit of why are people interested in IoT in, in our context? Yeah, thanks, Michael. And, you know, obviously it's it's easy to see that IoT continues to play a growing part in everybody's day-to-day -day lives, right? I'm guessing each person attending today uses IoT in some shape or fashion and probably with multiple devices, right? We have smart watches, smart appliances, smart TVs, smart cars, um, all of these things we call smart, but we have IoT devices uh, more and more prevalently uh, available in our life. But from a business perspective, if you are a developer or a manager or an architect and you're trying to see, you know, am I in an industry that cares about IoT? The short answer is most likely yes, because IoT technology now is really transcending across many different industries, right? Um, so we have IBM I clients, for instance, in the trucking industry who are managing their fleet to make sure that uh, things like the temperature of their meat when it's in shipment is good to keep the, the product safe and so on. You know, we have clients in the medical industry and they're investing in smart smart devices that are easier to maintain, have uh, lower rates of failure and, and things like that as well. So IoT is uh, very prevalent in many, many industries these days. Um, okay, now just, oh yeah, there, there you go. We'd lost your video there for a second, so you're back. Oh, sorry, I'm back. All right, yep. fantastic. Um, so oh, we, we do have, there. Oh, lost me again, all right. Okay, now, now we see you again. But. All right, fantastic. Um, so a simple publisher example that we have here is uh, written with that MQTTJS project that Michael mentioned. Um, that is uh, relatively easy to use, relatively flexible. Um, and it's kind of the tool of choice for us because of those reasons, right? Um, oh, lost yeah. my video again. We're, get, we're getting um, a little bit of technical uh, glitches. Here, <laughs> a little bit of technical glitches. Uh, the IoT technology works much better than uh, my current <laughs> right. my current uh, webcam technology. But um, top to bottom, it's a pretty simple example in, in the sense that we just require some pretty common modules that you see with FS and PATH. We require in this MQTTJS module. And 
you know, most of the code is actually setting up the SSL bit because we chose in our demos that we set up to encrypt the communications with TLS. And so that requires us to set up the options with uh, the client certificate and certificate authority, trust stores and things like that. And so really you can see we're just setting that up in this MQTT options object. And then we call the MQTT JS library to connect to the broker of choice. In this particular case, it's an IBM I system we use for demo. And then once we're subs uh, connected, uh, we can subscribe to a topic. And in this case, we just spit that output out to uh, the console just for quick demo debug purposes. Right, and the previous one, the previous page just showed, you know, actually publishing on the, the same topic. Yep, absolutely. And, and the code is pretty much the same. It's just the only thing that's different is what are you going to do once you get connected? You register a callback for a message received versus um, calling the red, readily made APIs for doing that simple publish to that MQTT broker. That's right. We just didn't want people, you know, anybody being able to publish to our broker. So we added some security. So now we can move on and, and actually look at some some devices. The the you know the 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 IoT devices you can use range from all sorts of different things and sizes. If you look at the the, the lower right, that's an ESP01. That's a very small, but it has built-in wireless and you know enough memory to be able to run a small program. And you know the one beside it is a slightly larger one that already has like a USB port. It's a uh, it's one that I commonly use because you can just plug it in, and now you've got something that's got some pins that you can use to uh, turn things on and off, take readings, um, and then all the way up to something like on the top left where we have uh, a Raspberry Pi where you can run a you know a real operating system, and you know all sorts of things in 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 between. I kind of like the 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 socket one on the on the right because that's one where actually you can load in your own JavaScript code, connect to an IT, IoT network, and turn the light on and off and stuff like that. In addition to, to some of the ones that we've built here, uh, this is another one I've I've worked on more recently. It shows that uh, the Wemos Mini D1, where it's it's a, a weight sensor, and so basically the the sensor that that reads the the weight, um, you know connects up to that little device, which can then connect and send over MQTT the, uh, the weight of whatever you put on top of it. You might also ask, well, what about some existing devices? So instead of trying to, to build my own, you know, build my own, um, there's a bunch of devices, but not all of them use MQTT. So a quite common pattern is to use um, a uh, MQTT bridge where you have that bridge converting from whatever protocol the devices are using into the MQTT protocol. In my example, there's a lot of devices out there that you can get that run on 433 megahertz. And so like we have a door sensor, a motion sensor, actually a fire alarm that will go off and, and again, send messages on 433. Uh, the most right one is a, is a temperature sensor. And I have a bridge written in, um, in, in Node.js actually. Uh, that can take the messages that come in through the 4, 433 megahertz and, you know, we can convert them to, uh, to MQTT and then use those messages. And actually, this one isn't written in Node, but this one's, uh, you know, built, built on, an, on ESP8266 that can, can do that conversion. So now let's look at what it would take to, say, build your own device, just so you can see that it's really not that complicated what's going on in the devices. If you want to build something that's purpose fit, um, you know, in industrial cases, you're more, more likely want to uh, buy a commercial device for support and so forth. But, you know, if you want to start experimenting and sort of proof of concept, what you might be able to do in your business, this is a good way to go start, get started. So let's imagine that, for example, your business grows plants. Maybe things like temperature, humidity, and light intensity throughout the day might be interesting. And, you know, in this case, this is something that I've set up. I'm growing a few plants in, in my basement, um, you know, mint and uh, basil, some nice spices, stuff like that. And I ended up, you know, through, through that device, which you can see there, it's built on, again, one of those ESPs, and it collects light, temperature, um, and humidity. And I, you know, through the MQTT network, I can fairly easily get that data out. And then, you know, I put together a Grafana dashboard that consumes that data and shows me, you know, the trends of the humidity, temperature, uh, and light. Um, you could set up alerts to say, okay, wait a sec, the lights went off when they're not supposed to, or if things are getting too hot, too cold, and so forth. 
this is the version of devices that we're actually going to show you in, in the demo, um, a slightly earlier version of those. I'm just trying to raise it up so you can see it. Um, and it builds in the DSP, has a light which blinks every time it's sending the message, and it collects light and temperature information. This is the circuit diagram of what it looks like. Um, so we have that Wemos, which has a nice USB port you just plug in. It's got a light sensor, which is that GL device. It's basically just a resistor that changes resistance um, based on uh, the, the amount of light that there is. It's connected to the analog pin on the, the Wemos uh, through a, you know, a res resistor divider so that you get a different value depending on how much light is being presented. And then on the right-hand side is a DS18B20, which is an integrated temperature sensor. And basically through sort of a one-wire protocol, uh, you can talk to it, ask for the temperature, and it gives that back to you. And then, you know, for uh, as, as shown when I was showing you a device, there's also an LED that we can turn on, turn off, and, and it's set up to turn on and off um, whenever it's sending you some data. Looking at what's actually in the device itself, uh, we saw uh, topics. So when I introduced the concepts, uh, topics were one of the, the important topics. And you can see there the light topic, the temp topic, and the LED topic. So those are the topics that the device will publish on when there's a light reading, a temperature reading, or, or uh, you know, basically you want to tell it to turn the light on or, or it, if the light changes. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see some of the code. And again, just like the case that, that Jesse showed us earlier in terms of the node client, a lot of this is just boilerplate so that we can get our connection to the network and our certificates. Um, again, over here is still more sort of boilerplate. The nice thing that you'll notice here is like, I didn't have to write the code to, to query that, that temperature sensor. There's already a Dallas temperature sensor um, uh, sort of library that's out there. And so we can leverage those in, in a lot of the things that we write. These tend to be, um, uh, the, you know, they tend to work very much like you would expect uh, an asynchronous system. And if you're familiar with Node, um, you know, through callback. So in this case, you know, part of the code is a callback that says, when I get a message posted to a particular topic, um, this is the code that I want to run. And in this case, it says like, you know, when I get a message, I'm going to tell, I'm going to check whether that's a message telling me to turn the light on or turn the right off and associated, you know, it then calls the function that will actually write the pin to, to make that change. Now we start to get into the, the code itself and, um, you can see that I'm creating the pub sub client and I'm passing here that callback, which we saw on the previous page to say, okay, this is the callback when you get a message that I want you, want you to run along with the connection info that says, you know, what's my MQTT uh, port and server string. The code itself here now is mostly around uh, getting the certificates all set up and um, passing in a unique ID. The one of the key things is every client really should have its own ID, otherwise I've found that some of the brokers get confused. So in this case, we use the um, the uh, MAC address as a unique ID because that's going to be unique for every, every, every device. And you can see here that uh, when we cr create our client, so we, you know, create a client, we've created a client, and within this loop, we basically at the, at the first we check to say, are we connected to the, the Wi-Fi? If so, let's start um, you know, if, if, if not, let's actually say, let's connect. Um, and here's where we're passing in that unique ID. And once we're connected, we subscribe to the topic, in this case, the LED topic that we can send. Then in, inside that loop, the other thing we do is every so often, so we've got our transmit interval seconds and delay, we want to take the temperature sensor, sen temp, temp, the temperature and light um, readings and publish them to a particular topic. So we saw those topics uh, earlier, the temp topic and the light topic. So this code basically you know, interacts with the library that I mentioned, uh, converts it to a string, because we said that the messages were just plain formatted text, and then publishes to the temp topic and the light topic, um, and then toggles the lead uh, so that you, you get some feedback that it's actually sending the data out. Now I showed you C++. If you don't like C++ and you want to do it in JavaScript, I won't go through the same description, but you can do that uh, through Esprino and you can write it in JavaScript. The code looks very similar. You have a similar loop. Um, and in fact, I did that to push the same code into 
uh, a demo type that device like this. And if you want to go check it out, you can go check out my GitHub repo to take a little more look and more detailed look through the code there. So now we're at demo time. I'll hand it back over to Jesse. So Jesse, you still there? Sorry about that. Yes, no I am here. Um, okay. We are going to walk you through a really quick demo and then we'll show you the code behind it. Uh, what we're actually going to do is we're going to show uh, consuming data from these uh, light and temperature sensors that Michael just talked about. And then we're going to actually store that information in a database to be used by other database applications. So set up to get this to this point. I have ActiveMQ running on my system. It happens to be an IBM I system, but that's not uh, necessarily relevant. It can be anywhere because these are all very portable. And we wrote a little bit of node code that I'll show you in a little bit. What that Node.js code does is make sure that the database exists. And you can see in this case, it already has the schema and everything because we've run this before. And now, because those devices are sleeping and sending data as temperature changes or light changes or every 10 seconds, you're going to see this light and temperature sensor data coming in on a periodic basis, right? And so when that light and temperature sensor comes in, we see the console output here and that uh, information is also available in the database. And so I'm gonna pop up an SQL tool here where I'm doing a simple select from this table that I created, this IoT records table uh, for temperature and sensor data. And you can see there's a couple tabs that popped up down on the bottom and you can actually see uh, the historical time behind the, the various sensor values for temperature and for light as well. So if and you're so interested, you see, that's that's the temperature in my uh, my office. And I can actually put my hand over the uh, the sensors here if we want to see the light go down a fair amount. Um, but maybe we'll come back and take a look at that afterwards. If you want to go go ahead and show the code. Yep. Now. If we have if we have time uh, we'll to do that, we'll yep. we'll circle back and do that in a little bit. But the code behind it is going to be very simple and very familiar to the code we showed you earlier in the presentation today. Um, and we're going to set up the connection to the broker in exactly the same way. We showed you the example uh, client certificate setup and the SSL setup. And Michael, uh, I need to stop sharing. Oh, sorry. Oh no, okay. I did stop sharing. We need you. To, we need the slides back up. Right. Um, there we go. Sorry. But the only thing that's different is, um, you know, when we're consuming data, we showed you this one before. We're consuming the data. We stick it in console. Dot log, you see it in the terminal. Um, but we're going to take that a step further, like I just showed. So if you go on to the next slide, we actually uh, wrote some code to store it to the database. And I'm not going to walk you through all the details here. We're using an IBM I database connector, creating a table if it doesn't exist, and uh, just doing some basic database setup there. And if we go to the next slide, all we did is we modified our callback for when we receive a message to do a simple insert into statement with SQL. And as you can see, it's just a few lines of code to get that level of integration. And so now any database application can interact with this IoT data. Yeah, and that's really, I think, one of the reasons why it's so popular is that really very small amount of code, just a few steps, and now you've got data flowing from the devices all the way into your database where you can you know, take some more sophisticated action and stuff like that. Yep, exactly. So, you know, we've shown you actually connecting the devices directly to um, the to a system which is running a broker. Uh, if you don't want to set up the, that 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 yourself, um, or you want to make it something that's like can go across, uh, you know, it's not necessarily stuck within your organization. One good thing to do is leverage leverage the cloud. So you could sort of do um, what's shown in this first picture, which is to move some of the pieces from your you know, internal system out into containers running in the cloud. And that's actually what I did for some of the applications I've been playing around with, is I ran uh, an MQTT broker in the cloud and then a node application. And in this, in this case, it's an example where, you know, either through, through a UI on a computer or on my phone, uh, it, can, it can talk to that controller, that controller will convert, you know, whatever buttons you press to say, turn on lights, turn off lights into an MQTT message. Um, 
put, publish it to that broker that's in the cloud, and then device that device, which is a plug, uh, you know, plugged into my house, um, you know, and is is connected to a Wi-Fi that can get out to the outside world, connects to the broker, and you you know now I'm controlling everything without having to be running a broker on my my own premises. But even better, uh, there's a number of IoT platforms that you can get from from organizations, um, and they will provide you. Um, all those pieces so that basically you can just say here's the devices I want to connect up to my my um, my uh, IOT system and you know both from the devices and from the clients the thing I did want to mention here is that there's the, the, you know the one thing that's a little bit different is they often have um, a few more constraints over things like the topic so for example in this particular part of the code I show that um, you know you need to change the light topic so they're structured in a way, for example, this is for the Watson IoT Cloud, in a way that, that fits uh, their, their environment because it's a multi-tenant environment. So in this case, you know, I need to say IoT2, event, light, and they even sometimes add some extra features. In this case, it's formatting. Um, so I can tell it what format the message is coming in. And um, so you know, I had to change the format of my, my topics and I had to change uh, the format of my messages. The nice thing about that though, is that then they let you very easily start to chart, graph, and work with that data because you know, having it being structured as JSON, for example, they can extract it and you can put it on charts and, and so forth. So if you're, you're getting into this, that's another good way to sort of have a, a quick bootstrap um, to getting charts, graphs, and data and all that kind of stuff. All right, and I'll quickly just mention a couple other tools that are available for doing IoT programming. One of uh, my favorites is Node-RED, which actually allows a low-code graphical type of uh, designer that allows you to just define your application logic as a flow of data through all these various nodes. Uh, and I worked with a client once who actually set up a very large uh, manufacturing integration with PLC devices all linked up through Node-RED. And it, was, uh, it, it works like a charm. And it's very simple to use, very easy to prototype and deploy to production. So that's something definitely worth looking into. Um, and another trend that we're seeing uh, is this whole notion of reactive systems. And so if you go out and you read the reactive manifesto, it comes in uh, you know, various key attributes that are are defined as a reactive system, right? It needs to be responsive, elastic, resilient, and message driven, right? And so we're seeing uh, an uptick in interest in messaging technologies and Kafka is quickly becoming the MO, the, the standard mode of operation, the messaging component of choice. Um, and so as you're defi defining your plan for IoT, you need to also maybe take this into consideration as well because your IoT data you might need to very, very well integrate with some kind of messaging system. There's a product out there called Apache Camel, which is really great, uh, as I say, for tying anything to anything, including tying IoT devices and technologies to messaging systems as well. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Michael to wrap things up. Yeah, I, I, you know, just to add on the reactive systems, I think, you know, the structure uh, uh, that we've seen in like the MQTT uh, side of things, you know, Jesse and I, yeah. uh, you know, joke that we we only use these devices every so often, but they keep working. I unplug them, yeah. I plug them back in. And so the reactive systems are sort of looking to leverage some of that same, same approach where the pieces are detached and decoupled. Um, and sort of the message broker is, is the piece that lets you glue it all together, but it's, it's a very resilient, um, you know, approach and, and way that you can scale. And, and yeah, we see that um, Kafka is, is quickly becoming the, the, the choice there. So when you're thinking about your, your IoT systems today, it would be good to think about, like, how are you going to bridge that data into maybe a, a bigger, uh, you know, uh, Kafka backbone that's serving your enterprise applications as well. I think that's all the time that we have today. We, we hope you, you enjoyed this sort of whirlwind introduction to what IoT is, um, some example of what some of the, you know, the, the, what it looks like in terms of, of you know, devices that you could build and experiment with, how you use uh, MQTT with Node.js and how it's such a great fit because, you know, uh, you know IoT is all around being asynchronous and asynchronous events and, and Node fits really nicely with that. Um, and then, you know, we hope that you see that, like, it's really, you know, there's, it's not that hard to get started to connect those devices in, 
get the data into your database as Jesse just, showed, and then even you know leverage the uh, you know larger cloud-based IoT systems, or you know plugging into your more uh, enterprise-oriented applications that might be using uh, reactive approaches in Kafka. Um, so thanks for watching, and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.